Zen at the Sharp End. Welcome to the podcast about how to turn difficult people and relationships into your best teachers. I'm Mark West Maquette, a Zen Buddhist teacher, mindfulness teacher, and ex professional astronomer. This is a podcast to go along with my book, Zen and the Art of Dealing with Difficult People. In each episode, we'll be exploring different varieties of people, relationships, and situations that we find irritating, difficult, or painful. Together with a number of Zen friends, I'll be discussing how the practices of Buddhism and mindfulness can help us see our difficult people as troublesome Buddhas, our greatest teachers. In my podcast, you've heard about how many others have learned to deal with difficult people and conflict. Are you interested in exploring this for yourself and applying that wisdom to your own life? Well, in July, I'll be running a Zen retreat all around conflict. Conflict generally, and more specifically in our personal relationships. The retreat will centre around three Zen koans, which will be our guides in exploring this area, and how to motivate our actions from a deeper sense of understanding and compassion. The retreat will be at Whaley Hall in Derbyshire in the UK, It'll be suitable for all, from beginners to Zen and meditation, to those with a more established sitting practice. We'll be following the schedule of a formal Zen retreat, and our time together will be held in silence, except for within a couple of the practices and the discussion. There's no fixed cost for this retreat, other than the accommodation fee, just a suggested donation of around £100. To find out more, follow the link in the episode notes. This podcast is sponsored by Zen Minded. If you get a chance, check them out at www.zenminded.uk. You'll find a curated selection of Japanese homeware and incense, a perfect match to your meditation practice. We're also sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers convenient and affordable therapy online. In my opinion, meditation and psychotherapy both offer valuable avenues for exploring our suffering, habits and stark areas. A while back I spent three and a half years meeting twice a week with a psychotherapist when things had become acute, and it felt like the help he gave me was really transformational, especially when supported by my regular meditation practice. If you're interested, they've extended an offer of 10% off your first month of therapy at betterhelp.com slash zen at the sharp end. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash zen at the sharp end. In this podcast, I'm interviewing Steve James, presenter of the popular Guru Viking podcast. Steve has a broad interest in spirituality, philosophy, world mysticism, body awareness and relational practices. He specialises in the unique interpersonal and strategic challenges faced by successful and highly visible individuals and works closely with the well-known therapist Michaela Bohm. In this interview, touching on Steve's broad experience and wisdom for dealing with difficult people, He highlights the Buddha's teaching on the eight worldly winds. The Buddha taught that we suffer because we cling to these positive winds and resist the negative ones. In dealing with challenging situations, Steve's found these very helpful in serving as an antidote to the sense of shock or injustice of a difficult encounter. He's observed that wise people don't typically celebrate a given situation, but instead take a more economist attitude. He mentions a story relating to the famous Zen master Hakuin that he's often meditated on and drawn deep inspiration from in this area of equanimity. And I've included the, the story in the show notes. Ah, So hi, Steve. Thank you so much for being willing to come on Zen at the Sharp End. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, so maybe we just start off by um, exploring a little bit about your journey up to this point, you know, your sort of practice and and where you've where you're coming from gosh yes and i think from a young age i was i had an interest and it comes really from two streams on the one hand when i was a little boy i went to karate class mm. when i was about five or so and i really loved it uh, in that way that young boys do and part of that karate class was of course, all the moves you do, the punching and the kicking and so on. And sometimes we'd stand there with our arm out and we'd hold the arm out for what felt like minutes. <laughs> yes. Probably it was like 
you know, 20 seconds, but it felt like minutes and working with the discomfort. And uh, we do things like sparring where you play basically a mock fight each other. And then suddenly uh, when you're all knackered, we'd sit down in our Cesar position, kneeling down and uh, meditate, controlling the breath, etc. And the teacher would give us some instructions in that regard. And I loved it. I lapped that aspect of it up. Mm. The uh, combat application, the effectiveness of the combat was really secondary in what captured my imagination. I think it was that, if you want, mind, body, spirit, uh, if I can be so cliched, um, uh, aspect. Yeah. And so I read then... A sort of combination of all of it. Yes, exactly. And the way in which the body and the mind could work together. Mm. Um, or And one could be a root to the other. And uh, the experience of each could be affected tremendously by each of you, by the other, that sort of thing. And so I found it very uh, inspiring and I read lots and lots of things and you can't read much. You can't go, it doesn't take you long when you start to read about, you know, martial arts and that sort of thing. You start to encounter the culture, the cultural context. And then you, of course, quickly encounter the religious and philosophical worldview, if you like, mm. um, as well. And from there, I was off reading in all sorts of different directions. And that was the first stream. And the second stream was at that time, I was an altar boy in the Catholic Church. And I come from this very small island called the Shetland Islands, very far north of Scotland. Mm. And we had a church there, Catholic Church, and I was an altar boy. But the sort of experience I had as an altar boy was, a, was not doctrinal at all. My mother had this idea, she'd tell us of a private faith where the mass was a sort of ritual that you'd attend uh, for your own, in a sense, personal contemplative um, activity, your own, if you want, you know, relationship to God or in that kind of a context, sometimes it's Mary, people, you know, have a devotion to whatever the case mm -hmm. is, rather than getting together into a, in a, in a church setting to celebrate all believing the same thing or to get together to celebrate being part of a community of like-minded individuals, etc. that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. That was um, kind of an... A, that was kind of an anathema <laughs> to her style, of, wow. her style of religion. And so it was very private, very contemplative and not doctrinal. So when the children would go off to the catechism, which is the Sunday school class that children are taught the, the tenets of the faith by a volunteer, she never allowed my brother and I to go, not wanted to, of course. Uh, we stayed instead with the adults um, in the mass itself and just participated in that ritual. And then quite quickly, uh, five or six, we were very young, I think, started doing altar boy duties. And that's a participatory role. You become an assistant of the priest and you carry candles around in a choreographed way or you bring him a cup at a certain point and then you take the cup away again and you ring a bell at a certain moment, you know, kneeling mm. off to the side. So you sort of engage in the ritual in this, in this uh, participatory way, in a somatic way, actually. Mm. And that's interspersed with periods of sitting at the back uh, quietly, uh, silently, in between you needed. So there's activity, and it's choreographed activity, and it's ritual activity, and it's not about you performing. Of course, you become a, a function of the sort of ritual, a, a part of it, mm. and then and a functionary. And then and then you intersperse that with sitting quietly mm. uh, for periods of time in this beautiful building, you know, with all of its uh, evocative architecture, the cold, the smells of the candles, the sounds of the mass and the chanting and various things like that. So everything is there and you're dressed as well. The altar boys, they wear a kind of vestments. Yeah. Vestments yeah. like you do, like the Zen. Um, uh, Robes and things. things. Yeah. Right. It's a bit like that. And so there's also that aspect too of, of, of the import of that and what effect that has on somebody. So uh, these two factors early on, um, I don't know if it was a chicken or an egg. I don't know if I was predisposed to that sort of thing or if that awoke, you know, uh, 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 something in me. I don't know. But I fell in love with both of those things and really for very similar reasons. Um, yeah. So mm. that, that was my, uh, if you like, background in, mm. in these things. Yeah. Mm, mm. Or origin. And, then, and then you went on to do some different kinds of practices later on or, or that was that was the sort of main foundation? Well, that was the that was the origin. Yes. That was the origin. Oh, yes. Yeah. Then mm. certainly later on, 
uh, doing all different kinds of weird and wonderful practices through the years, uh, following that Christian tradition for uh, a while, particularly mm-hmm. in its contemplative aspects and various different. We're, we're, it's too long, perhaps, to discuss here, but I know these are short and focused episodes. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, and then of course, uh, eventually yoga training in different kinds of yoga, qigong, and meditation mm. uh, in all sorts of different traditions and including in the Buddhist tradition, that's right, um, in mm. all three vehicles, in fact. Uh, mm. now, I, I mean to only say, not to say that I'm some sort of you know, master of the vehicle, I'm not trying to say that, but that um, uh, my, if you want, exploration and curiosity and training, at least, has been in uh, in those sorts of contexts. And, and so it sounds very, very broad and, uh, yes. and, and diverse in your experiences. Mm. Yes, for example, and I, I seem to be drawn to teachers like that. So one of my main meditation teachers, if you'd like some specifics, is Shinzen Young. Mm, oh, yeah. Shinzen Young, uh, American uh, meditation teacher, Buddhist teacher. Uh, well, let's say maybe just meditation teacher. I think he's broader than just Buddhism. Mm. And he was initially ordained in the Shingon uh, uh, tradition in Japan. He went there as a PhD candidate to do his... Uh, studies on Shingon and they wouldn't tell him anything because it's an esoteric system and they said it's for transformation not for study he wanted to make it his academic bailing Uh, yeah 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 so he memorized their liturgy um and impressed them with that sufficiently that they they allowed him to enter the temple and he ordained there and went through their uh, ordination process and their sort of trial process where you dump cold water on your head in the middle of winter for uh, 100 days or something like that and you get your yidam your titular de- uh, deity assigned to you and they have this whole sort of um you know vajrayana-esque yeah uh, yeah. initiation that they do um so that that was uh, his initial if you want exposure but at that same time he became very deeply uh, involved with zen and uh training in that and he had uh, many Zen teachers. Quite famously, he was uh, the translator and close uh, student of uh, Sasaki Roshi in the States mm. for a long mm-hmm. time, um, and others too. And he trained um, in various different sort of, uh, I suppose you could say, um, you know, Vipassana types as well, types mm-hmm. of meditation with different mm-hmm. teachers. And then he, in his own he's quite an innovator in that sense. So he innovated his own kind of, if you like, um, system, which was a system of a taxonomy, a way of categorizing and uh, framework to categorize the different world contemplative traditions. Uh, not in such a way that um, they all become one mush, but in a way that gives them their own, if you like, unique individual uh, flavors without uh, mm. dampening this. So, um, Training with him was wonderful because we did all sorts of stuff. We do, you know, of course, very Vipassana things, but then also we would do uh, loving kindness things. And also we would do things that were more, I suppose, um, you know, visualization and Mm -hmm. these sorts of things. And uh, wonderful exposure to different traditions. He has a very eclectic Mm -hmm. view. And he said to us, one of his great goals for us was to, that we would uh, be able to find ourselves in any religions, contemplative situation and be able to practice on their own terms yeah i see, um, I see. to do, to do zen in a zen retreat uh, not necessarily be very good at it of course but to understand what was going on mm, be able yeah. to participate full full uh throttle in 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 that mm. training or but that or to find yourself in you know uh, some sort of uh, monastery in burma or so and doing, mm. doing a pastor and be able to follow that understand um what they're what they're what they're getting at and to be what, what they're on about yeah yeah so ra- rather than secretly be doing zen in the in the back of the burmese yeah. monastery because that's my practice you know uh, that sort of thing. so he had that kind of eclectic well, view. i think that leads us very nicely into thinking about um our approach with dealing with people that we find difficult uh, which is basically a non-secular <laughs> you know like anyone in every tradition in every s- level of society in every part of the world encounters people that are difficult and finds people some people more difficult than others so i think it, it no matter where we're coming from we need to find ways that to, we can um, learn from and grow from those encounters so um, so maybe 
I mean, just kind of sliding gently into this topic, um, where would you say in your background that arose for the first time, that idea that when we encounter people that are difficult, it's not just someone to avoid, that there's some kind of learning in that? I think it's foundational to most religions, this idea. If you're yeah. talking about the very first time it arose, I mean, it's crucial in Buddhism. How many methods are there to deal with this sort of a situation? How many descriptions are there of its value uh, for the training of the of of you know the individual dealing with difficult people in difficult situations? How many? Uh, many. Mm, yeah. Uh, what about Christianity? It's crucial to Christianity. This idea of dealing with those you know who mistreat you or difficult people you don't you know get on with. It's crucial in Christianity. It's crucial, I think, also in, uh, I think, of Greek and Roman times, you know, Seneca, this sort of thing. Mm. I think of that, and it's crucial there too. It seems a perennial question, what to do about people who are, who you don't get on with, one way or another, whether that's mm. someone at work who's bothering you or <laughs> some sort of, you know, Greek tragedy and level blood feud. Yeah. How do you resolve these sorts of situations? How can we move on when we've been slighted? in a way that, um, you know, is effective. So I think the first time it arose for me, I couldn't possibly answer that. Yeah. I think it's it's everywhere, isn't it? This, this These sorts of ideas. So in, embedded from the ground up, like infused from the beginning kind of thing. In culture and religion, I think it is. it is This theme is certainly um, there in, in both culture and religion. Well, I think that, that, that sounds to me that you've had a very, very... Uh, wonderful and um, and grounded and broad kind of upbringing because I think for for many people that doesn't dawn on them uh, maybe ever <laughs> or you know later in their life that the idea that difficult people are actually someone some people that we can learn from um, is a, is sort of a new concept for some people oh my gosh it's not someone we just need to avoid so that's that's really quite special yeah I think that's why it's talked about so often in religious situations and in cult in these sorts of more, you know cultural situations that I'm pointing to, why is it talked about so often? Because I think it is very counterintuitive, as you correctly mm. point out. It's not mm. something that just sort of dawns on dawns on you right away. And it's also really easy to forget it. Mm. Um, you can write the book on it, which you have, and and still forget. Well, tell, really tell me about it. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. you know, and still forget it. So it's the sort of thing that one needs to keep soaking oneself in. That, you know, that perspective and reminding yourself because it's when you are able to approach situations and difficult people and situations with those sorts of frames it's so much better yeah it's so much better but it's so easy to forget mm. Mm. yeah so okay so can you tell me more a little bit about your experience of that better like how have you experienced that as a sort of and that now i come to well, 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 maybe we should go back a little bit more and say, well, for you, what's your sort of process about dealing with people that you find difficult? What what have you found has been helpful? Yeah. Well, I was pondering this um, in advance of us of us talking, and um, especially I was pondering in in the, in the theme of uh, Buddhism, mm. and your your questions were around that, and I was thinking, gosh. What is it in Buddhism that I always think of? Or, you know, well, we don't have to be so, you know, contained within Buddhism. Maybe just, you know, I'm interested in your particular um, view of these. Well, as it happens, Buddhism. yes, as it happens, there are some things in Buddhism that have um, been very meaningful to me in this, in exactly this sort of situation. So I thought I might limit it to that. Mm. The first, the first is this idea of the eight worldly winds and i think one of the things that i've noticed in myself sometimes in dealing with difficult people or difficult situations is there can be a reaction of of a sense of injustice this shouldn't be happening there's something wrong about this you know um and i don't mean injustice in the sense that uh someone's doing a crime or something like that, but the mere fact that i'm inconvenienced can seem to me uh, sometimes as something quite wrong <laughs> something seems wrong about this mm. uh, rejecting the situation um 
That doesn't imply, of course. Anyway, and so thinking of the eight worldly winds, which is this idea that uh, it's from the Lokavipati Sutta, the, 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 fa- the faults or the failings, the defects, if you like, of the world. Mm. Um, and it, the, in there, they have this idea of gain and loss, status or fame and disgrace, sometimes fame and infamy, it said, praise mm. and censure, pleasure and pain. And the idea that in samsara, as they put it in, in that context, you're going to encounter these things. Everybody encounters them. Sometimes you win, gain. Sometimes you lose. Yeah. Sometimes your status is elevated. You know. Other times you're disgraced, maybe even canceled. Uh, sometimes you're praised. Sometimes you're criticized yeah. justly or unjustly, uh, fairly or unfairly. And sometimes you experience you know, nice things and sometimes you experience pain. Mm. Mm. And... Uh, in that sutta, um, the Buddha is talking about it, and he says that the ordinary people, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi just uh, translates it as a run-of-the-mill person, <laughs> celebrates the gain, if you like, and rebels against the loss. Yes, you know, or, or kind of craves one and, and rejects the other, isn't it? Mm. Right. So when something good happens, you celebrate it, you know, you're happy about it, and then when something bad happens, you rebel against it. And that's what I'm talking about, the sort of rejection of the situation. And he says that the uh, sort of noble, the noble ones, they don't do that. They don't welcome the gain. They don't rebel against the loss. They sort of have a more equanimous, I suppose, view of the situation. I found that to be very helpful, to mm. recognize that actually this is what life is like, that sometimes good things happen, sometimes they don't. You know, and you're getting praised, and this is wonderful, I'm being praised, but um, yeah, it'll last a certain amount of time, but, you know, inevitably it's going to pass uh, of course it's just as likely that some uh, negative uh, criticism will come my way and that's just that's just kind of life and i found that to be extremely uh, excellent antidote to this sense of injustice the sense of shock or surprise or how can i get out of this situation mm-hmm. how can i you know put this right well it's sort of this it's already kind of right that's just how things are get yeah. that. and that does not imply i don't think to me anyway a passivity towards the situation uh, how you respond to the situation is a secondary thing, but it's a, it's the sense of one's relationship to it having happened at all. Mm. That crucial point, um, that rebellion or kicking off it inside it, it having happened at all whatsoever, and this assumption that somehow it shouldn't should things shouldn't be that way. So kind of like an attitude or a worldview. Yes, mm-hmm. and I find that uh, enables me to be much more creative. And access a great deal. I mean, when I'm able to successfully apply it, you know, bear in mind, I fail at this, you know, all the time. But um, you asked what I should hold dear from the Buddhist mm-hmm. tradition anyway. That um, That's one of them. And the other one, and this is from, this is a Zen one. I thought you might like it because it's Zen. It's very famous, Zen one. Shall I read this thing to you? For yeah, me? please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is from uh, Zen Flesh, Zen Bones mm. by, Paul, by Paul Reps. Yeah. The Zen master, Hakuin. He's one of your guys, right? Yeah. Yep. The Zen master Hakuin was praised by his neighbors as one living a pure life. A beautiful Japanese girl whose parents owned a food store lived near him. Suddenly, without any warning, her parents discovered she was with child. This made her parents angry. She would not confess who the man was, but after much harassment, at last named Hakuin. In great anger, the parents went to the master. Is that so, was all he would say. After the child was born, it was brought to Hakuin. By this time, he'd lost his reputation, which did not trouble him. But he took very good care of the child. He obtained milk from his neighbours and everything else the little one needed. A year later, the girl mother could stand it no longer. She told her parents the truth, that the real father of the child was a young man who worked in the fish market. The mother and father of the girl at once went to Hakuin to ask his forgiveness, to apologise at length, and to get the child back again. Hakuin was willing. In yielding the child, all he said was, is that so? Mm. Mm. Yeah. That, when I first, ever since I first read that, that has been something that I've cherished as a, almost a sort of a koan in a way, Mm. of 
of how to deal with misunderstandings, being misunderstood, misconstrued, um, or in, and you know, in any other way, kind of. Well, when you when those eight worldly winds, when some of those eight worldly winds blow your way, how to react? I find it very profound indeed. Indeed, yeah. This absolutely. openness, this openness to accept the situation is is happening now how you respond like i said this doesn't mean one is passive necessarily how one mm. responds is another matter entirely I, I suspect that hackman had to be very very active in his ability to look after little little baby <laughs> i would imagine so yes mm-hmm. and every time he had to go to get milk from his neighbors he was hackoween that supposedly pure zen monk who knocked up that village girl the mm. shame of it mm. each time he you know he had to labor under that um every act of care for that baby that was seen was also framed if you like pre-framed by that mm. shameful fall from grace uh, which was actually not, not not the case so i think there's something very profound about that kind of a thing and i've um i've meditated on that often mm. Mm. in my in observing my own uh you know as I think many people have, but certainly I have. You want to be understood, don't you? You want to, you want to be uh, well thought of in life. <laughs> but it's not so easy sometimes. And uh, I've meditated on that a great deal. It's brought me a, a lot of uh, comfort. So, I mean, I thank you a lot for bringing that, that up because, you know, I've read it before, but I haven't thought about it for a while. And it just makes me think very much. We've, we've got a little one, you know, he's just uh, just turned 18 months and um, uh, so much of my time, you know, with him is just doing my absolute best to try to be with him, be with him, be be what he needs at that moment. And it's so tempting to judge and to wish that things were different and want to be somewhere else and get on your phone and think I've got all this stuff to do otherwise. But it's it's like a it's a practice, and it, it feels very active to me to try to like just be here you know and listen to him saying the same thing 25 times or or do the same you know and just kind of be present with him uh, you know it feels very very active practice to me uh, and and difficult <laughs> so i i was wondering like when you say meditate on that that situation or previously you said about um that you're sort of making this a worldview or the attitude, not necessarily the actions that you take, but like approaching certain, you know, whether when the praise comes or the blame comes or whatever it is, how do we actually get better at that? Or how have you found, like when you meditate on it, what does that, what does that mean to you? Yes. In that sense, I think you're, something you're saying there is making me think that, you know, meditation is often we think of meditation as very, specific range of activities uh, sitting on the meditation cushion watching the breath for example or um, body scans or whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. some sort of uh, technique like that Um, but I think we could say that of course it depends on one's definition that we could extend the definition of meditation to include um, a wider range of activities than that and if we look broadly around the traditions of the world um, or even if we still limited to Buddhism in the Mm. context of this discussion. There's such a diverse array of, if you want, meditation techniques um, that often don't quite fit that idea of sitting there watching your breath or, you know, emptying your mind or whatever that, you know, we get really cliche with it. So, I mean, a good example is the koan practice uh, from your tradition. Mm. That's a strange, that's a strange thing to do, to have some sort of uh, setup like that. It's the sound of one hand clapping, or it does a dog have Buddha nature, or something like that. And you just sort of you meditate with that. Well, how do you meditate with a concept? How do you meditate with you know? What does that exactly mean? Of course, that's the great part of the great profundity of that koan tradition. Mm. Um, so I think it's also meditation. I think uh, can include a kind of taking of an idea and sort of thinking about it and uh, exploring it. So this idea, uh, well, for example, in, in, in certain Buddhist traditions, they have this idea of the fourth, four thoughts that turn the mind. Where does it turn the mind? Towards the practice of uh, you know, religion, towards the practice of dharma. They say that, right? I suppose the eight worldly winds would come under that fourth category. So the idea of that sort of a technique is you, 
in, in sort of thinking about those things, your meditation session then is sort of you sit there and you think about that. Gosh, death is certain. Gosh, all, all the coolest people in the world <laughs> history have died as well. I'm going to die too. Mm. There's no one who's not going to die. Wow, okay, gosh. And then you sort of contemplate that and it puts things into perspective. Um, and I think sometimes contemplating the eight worldly wins, for example, just thinking about that. Yeah, praise. Yeah, think, of, think about praise. When I'm praised, what are, when are times I've been praised? How did that feel? Yeah, that was good. What about uh, when I've been blamed? What's that been like? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. When I've done it, when mm. I've been justified in being blamed, in my opinion, or not justified in my opinion, what's that been like? And you can sort of examine the mind states and how, how you've reacted and, and get quite some insight. This is something I think that, um, uh, you know, that we, we see in other other traditions as well. Imagining um, or th- considering ideas like this and then sort of imagining them and, and remembering them and, and pondering them and, and yeah. thinking that too. Gosh, and, you know, if I think in my future, what if in the future I get lots of status? Yeah, that'd be great. What if in the future I'm terribly disgraced? What would that be like? We don't need to look far beyond the Zen tradition for good examples of that. So some uh, mm. quite famous Zen masters and mm. they're just horribly disgraced later in, later in their career, That's various right, different yeah. things they've done. So, you know, you think, mm. gosh, that supposedly very enlightened, very enlightened, or even that very enlightened person screwed up. <laughs> mm. I know I'm not enlightened. Mm. Mm. So dealing with difficult people is, is a very immediate and um, in, in daily life kind of thing as well as things we can reflect on and think about in, right. in our quiet time. So what, what about putting some of these things, you know, in that moment where you're there in an interaction with someone and you're feeling really like shaken up or you feel like the anger rising or like, what about in that moment? How, how have you found? Yes. Well, I think then? so let's say mm. as you've done, you've proposed, okay, you're encountering someone difficult, you're going to get someone difficult and you want to work on that or address that somehow. Well, I think you've got three times you can do it. You can do it beforehand, you can do something during maybe, and you can do something afterwards. So things like, uh, um, you know, this was by no means an exhaustive list of things I came up with, but things like contemplating the eight worldly winds, for example, okay, or uh, pondering this Hakuin thing. Um, there are many others too. Uh, things like that, are things you do beforehand, right? Um, generally speaking, mm. and in doing it beforehand, you sort of you're, you, you're training yourself so that over time, if you do that, you begin to see things a little bit differently. And then, then yeah, a situation comes up, a situation arises, and and one finds a bit more space, different sort of perspective is available for the situation. You're not quite right away in this knee jerk of how could this happen or how could this person be, you know, this yeah. person's annoying me and there's something fundamentally wrong about the fact that that's even happening. You know, this is this sort of idea becomes that idea can become a bit softened. That perspective can become a bit softened. It's a bit like it's a sort of brainwashing, I suppose, that you do to yourself uh, in the sense that it's a conditioning um, by contemplating it in advance. I find it's quite effective. Yeah. And then, yes, you've got something to do in the middle of a situation, then, and, uh, which be, which was your, the point of your question, and then afterwards too, you can uh, contemplate something afterwards and go back over a situation and process the uh, physical, psychic, emotional, by psychic I mean mental, it's like you know, um, residue mm. of the situation, and in some techniques, one re- can re- even reimagine the scenario going better. So there's things you can yeah. do before and after, right? But what about during? Gosh, there's so many techniques for this. Buddhism has so many techniques for this. So many different mind training techniques and things to do. One thing I find uh, can be quite helpful is to keep, uh, remain in a sense, in contact with the sensations of the body. And one of the, a nice way of doing that, there's a few different ways of doing that. Some people like to take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath, count to 10, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, another thing that can be mm-hmm. done, I think, is... Uh, kind of wriggling of the toes or wriggling of the fingers of the toes, some sort of bodily movement to interrupt the uh, chain Mm. of reactivity. Sometimes that can be good Um, and it can bring you back because very often I think when 
anger, and you're talking here of anger, uh, arises, the mind is in several places at once. The, it's not just that moment that's involved. The anger seems to recruit memories of past uh, irritations, projections of future yeah. irritations, and also tremendous amount often of self-concern or of self-awareness. Mm. Um, that those 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 sorts of there's a there's a great recruiting of all of this material. Yes, and just to say, I think also, I mean, s some people respond very um, habitually through anger and rising energy. Some people respond very habitually through a kind of backing away and an avoidance. And I, and I, I get the sense that what what you say there actually applies in both situations. There's a there's a there's a that in, in the anger sense, we remember when we've been hurt and we were angry before, but also in the avoidance sense, we remember when we ran away, when we, we couldn't face it, when we when we were overwhelmed before. And but the future is the same, in my view. Any kind of technique of watching the mind, uh, which one, you know, one builds those skills in meditation, um, applied at that moment can be an effective antidote. So I think um, I found... Uh, in the moments where I have acted slightly more skillfully than not, and you know those moments are preciously few, but in those moments, it's almost always been some kind of technique or some kind of capacity that has been trained prior that somehow manages to make an appearance, mm -hmm. uh, some ability to notice that I'm in an act that anger is occurring rather than to believe the anger. How do you do that? Well, I mean, there's 101 yeah. ways to do that, and that's not really the point. The point is that you notice it. Oh, because well, I thought yes. of this, or I yeah. felt focus on my breath, or I moved my, you know, I moved my fingers and toes, or I did a mantra, or whatever it is, or I think I thought of the eight worldly winds. I thought it's awfully windy in here today, Mark. Well, however you do it, it's not really yes. the point. Those are all just means to an end. Those, those particular methods, and they're all useful. But the point is that to notice, I think, that state is occurring to recognize that um, it's occurring rather than to believe it. And then, of course, once, once we notice, sure. then, I mean, I don't know, what, what do you think? I mean, once we notice that we're, we're, that we're the anger is arising or the avoidant behavior is arising, then, then what? We, once we know, I'm not um, in a position to advise anybody on this. Well, once, <laughs> once, once one notices or once yeah. you notice that the anger or whatever it is, the behavior or the habit, habit is arising, that, then what, what, what does that give us? What I think it can give one um, is options, I think, rather than being carried away mm. by the anger on the pattern that it dictates, one has options to act differently. The, uh, that energy of anger can transform into a playfulness, for example, or a joy. The person can be uh, seen rather than in relationship to oneself, fundamentally in opposition to oneself. One sees the other as a sort of enemy in relationship to oneself, the key aspect being in relationship to oneself. They become reduced to their um, effect on you. Um, there's a possibility of jumping that track and seeing them as they are, <laughs> more like that. Or rather, mm -hmm. uh, a more skillful oh. way of putting that maybe would be not just in terms of their relationship to you. I think that's also a very, yeah. very powerful thing. You see, oh, here's a... You see them, you see the physical appearance of that person, you hear the sound of the voice, you, you see the animation of their, um, of their intelligence occurring and somehow unhooking it or jumping it from the tracks of, of the filter of one's own self-concern just takes the sting out of it. Just takes the, it's a little bit like, mm -hmm. um, you know, when a toddler says, uh, um, I hate you, daddy, or whatever it is, you know, or a toddler will something you know, say, kids say strange things to you, right? There. And then, and, yeah, yeah. and then, That's and it. then you don't get upset about it. Generally speaking, it's a kid, you know, it's a kid saying a strange thing. They don't yeah. know what they're saying, or, you know, you just don't get upset about it. Uh, but if somebody else says something to you, then you do get upset. What's the difference? But most of your reaction, being able to see the anger as an, as an experience, as a state that's occurring, allows one to be less if you want dictated to by it and and you start to see this this whole person in front of you not just their behavior not just their effect on you not just the way that they're 
they're relating to you and what effect that it has on your particular sense of self. You see this whole other person with their own stuff and their history and their conditioning and their... Yeah, yeah that might know. be something. But I think it's mainly, I think the operative thing is that it's the unhooking of the filter of the self-concern. That seems to be the liberating yeah. uh, fact uh, or factor rather okay. than, mm-hmm. and instead of seeing them like that, seeing them like this, oh, here's a person with their own history and their own stuff. I think it's helpful for sure, but it seems to be the um, not making it all about oneself. Buddhism, I think, certainly has such a wealth of methods and techniques and reframes uh, to approach those sorts of situations. And uh, it's been wonderful to explore some of them. Wonderful. I mean, thank you so much for bringing all of your wisdom and your experience, your your very diverse and uh, broad experience and wisdom on this. I mean, it's been fantastic to, to chat and chew over ideas. As you say, we could probably carry on this such a vast topic. Thank you. It's been wonderful chatting with you, Mark. Mm, yeah, thank you very much. Mm. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review and a star rating on whatever platform you use. And do recommend it to others because we all meet difficult people and each of those meetings presents an opportunity for learning and growth. I also have a downloadable video course in how to deal with difficult people. Head over to my website for more information, markwestmaquette.co.uk. Thanks for listening.